Dragonflight is a week away, and with it comes all the wonderful and delicious exposition and hypotheticals that come along with being a fan of WoW lore. Two years ago, we attempted to gleam information about Shadowlands before release, and were mostly right. Our first episode on Buon Somdi posited that he was merely one god of death and that the source of all the Horde's misery stemmed from the Zulfaraki troll tribe's god of death, Mazala, being coerced into nudging pieces into place for the Jailer, telling the dying Zul'jin in hushed whispers to make Sylvanas Windrunner the new leader of the Horde. This was a mystery that lasted two expansions, and that was finally answered in sort of an underwhelming way. A throwaway line from Mazala that said that he was the one making Bonsomni's life all complicated. This is all to say that part of the fun of theory crafting lore and writing this podcast isn't making a Nostradamus like guess and the thrill from being right, but instead seeing where the plot moves and how things are moved into place. It's the journey, not the destination. And all of that relates to, to Dragonflight because we've been given a number of big lore drops in the last few weeks, not only with the launch of the Drakthir starting area of the Forbidden Reach, but also in the form of the Legacies video series showcasing bronze Dragonflight leader Nosdormu leading a newly awakened Drakthir soldier through the events leading to the awakening of the Evokers and why the Dragon Isles are coming back to life now. And if it wasn't obvious, go check those videos out. They're six minutes piece. Um, you'll probably end up seeing them in game eventually because they are in the same style as the same videos that came out for Shadowlands and those definitely ended up in the games. But still, get a head start on it. And with it comes one fascinating piece of lore that is the kicking off point for this episode. Point in fact, there are a lot of little lore pieces that would be easy to miss if you aren't obsessively combing over every piece, like some podcast hosts might. Not naming names. This includes a former cult finding a new and somewhat similar purpose. That somewhat redemption of a former raid boss, the return of a name not seen since Vanilla WoW, and a convergence of villains that can't ever go away for good, it seems. So, today on Essence of Azeroth, we're going to get you ready to Dragonflight over to the new expansion, bringing all y'all up to speed on why it's a big darn deal that a proto-drake has the entire dragon race sweating bullets. After all, can you really say that you're ready to play the new expansion if you aren't caught up on the lore? Of course not. <clears throat> Hopefully. This is Essence of Azeroth. Generous support for the podcast comes from our Patreon givers, including Bergen, Brooke, Melissa, Otto, and Kelly. Be like the cool kids and support the podcast for as low as $3 a month over at patreon.com forward slash essence of Azeroth. You'll get access to our Discord, a spot in our Horde Guild on Asgalore in the US, and my undying devotion. Patreon.com forward slash essence of Azeroth. Say, friend, it looks like you might want to read a World of Warcraft book or two, but who has the time for actual, literal reading? Instead, why not try a free 30-day trial of Audible.com and get an audiobook that's yours to keep forever, even if you don't subscribe after the trial? There's never been a better time to listen to any of the great Warcraft books, so head over to audibletrial.com forward slash lover. That's M-U-R-L-O-C-L-O-V-E-R. -E and help support the podcast today in the easiest of ways. That's audible.com forward slash Murloc Lover. And now, on with the show.
Depending on what kind of WoW fan you are, you either love or hate when old stories get recontextualized to change the lore. And as we've talked about before, lore is and should be a living thing. But this is also how storytelling works. I saw a Blizzard forum post just today complaining about how they don't care about the new Proto Drake villain, and it's because it's just another made up character, not a part of the lore. And um, I think they're missing a few major steps about how story writing works, and that this is all a fictional universe, and that I should stay away from the Blizzard official forums at all costs, but fine. Just like Drake said, no new friends, no new friends, no new friends, no, no, no. I will never sing that again. <laughs> One problem, much like we said a few weeks ago, Dragonflight is really a new era for WoW, mostly because there aren't any old foes really left to tackle in the way that this person who clearly holds a lot of love for the pre-WoW lore wants things to be. I mean, let's look at the various. The human traitors of Alterac? Dead. The Lich King and the Scourge? Gone. Or at least not an issue currently. The Burning Legion? They'll be back eventually, but that's what they do. And we haven't had enough demons for a long while, if you ask me. This leaves us with the Dragons. Somewhat put on ice for the past decade of expansions, and no longer the power they once were, thanks to giving up their immortality to power up the Demon Soul and shoot Deathwing out of the air in the Dragon Soul raid at the end of Kata. But here's where we catch this mysterious troll in a trap of their own making. Dragonflight is actually full of old lore so far, much of which hasn't been explored since Kata, and even maybe since Vanilla WoW. Short rundown that we've gotten a taste of in the last few weeks includes the Tauran tribe known as the Grim Totem, the Twilight Hammer cult that once followed Cho'Gal and Deathwing, the literal elemental lords, and a minor retcon slash explanation of how Neltharion lost his mind to madness. Is that enough old lore for you, pal? That leaves us with a lot of ground to cover if the Drakthir starting zone and these legacy short films are going to make any sense. So let's start with the biggest questions. First, why are the Dragon Isles back open? Why are the Drakthir awake? And why was this lab experiment race that seemed to have all the powers made in the first place? Some conjecture is ahead, but much like the first episode of Essence of Azeroth, I think it's safe guessing and not wild stabs in the dark like so many YouTube channels like to do nowadays. And I know this because my algorithm will not let me get away from any of them. Let's start with the catalyst for all of this happening. And no, I'm not about to say it starts with the Titans. Though it does start with the Titans. Um, ignore that part. Edit that out in the future, Will. Long ago, before Neltharion and Maligos both lost their marbles, they came together to solve an idea. How could they combine the best aspects of the flights as a legacy to protect Azeroth? Both had experienced the growing influence of the mortal worlds on their titan-forged terra firma. Seeing that the burgeoning races that stemmed from both titan influence and from the wild guards had a propensity for good and the ability to do great things with the right guidance. The blue and black aspects also saw that their powers were strongest when combined and working in harmony. So an experiment came to fruition. Bring the combined might of the five magic sources into an army created in the image of the mortals and of the dragons together formed into a singular hive mind and working to protect the Dragon Isles and, eventually, Azeroth itself, because even the Aspects were aware, despite being immortal, these things don't seem to last and, eventually, somebody else will have to pick up that mantle. And so the Drakthir were born, a race of dragon-mortal hybrids made up of the five Aspects colors, following the will of Neltharion. Unknown to the Dragon Aspects, however, was a growing threat in the elementally charged Proto-Drakes. 
those who rejected the gift of the Titans, and instead called forth the primal plains of Azeroth that once ruled before the Titans came down from on high and calmed the seas, ceased the flowing lava, quieted the thunder, and bent the very rock to their will. The elemental lords had long ago been sealed away to alternate planes of reality and away from Azeroth, but their presence is always there, like a leaky faucet that can't ever be turned off. And that's the origin of the Primalists, proto-drakes and their believers that wish to return the world to its primordial beginnings and eject the Titan presence from Azeroth once and for all. And just so we're clear here, I want to make sure that when we say proto-drake, I'm not using it as a negative connotation or like they're weaker or they're lesser dragons. Um, when we say proto-drakes and proto-dragons, we actually mean kind of like the brutish, unevolved former form of these. And in the case of what we're going to talk about, um, proto-dragon actually means incredibly large and incredibly strong. Remember, Galakrond was a proto-dragon, and, you know, he almost ate everybody. So just some food for thought there to think about. The leader of the Primalist is the great proto-dragon Razagath, the thunder made flesh and the first of the proto-dragons to turn away from the titan's gift, channeling the storms of the elemental plane and holding a permanent grudge against the dragon aspects for turning away from the assumed origins of Galakrond. And while the timeline is iffy, it's revealed in the Dragonflight Legacy short that what led to the stasis of the Drakthir armies came when Razageth attacked the Forbidden Reach, coming for Neltharion and looking to raise the Dragon Isles. And while the Drakthir were tough and dedicated warriors all working in unison of a hive mind thanks to the magic of Malagos and Neltharion, it wasn't enough. The great proto-dragon seemed unstoppable. Until a voice reached out to Neltharion into the void, offering a trade. Save your creations, save the Dragon Isles, all for giving in to the void. This voice was that of Nazoth, making itself known to the Earth Warder and offering the ability to save his legacy for a darker purpose. And this is actually a massive addition to the lore, and I actually gasped when I saw this video. Uh, for the longest time, the most we got out of the corruption of Deathwing was that the Earth aspect was always vulnerable to the Old Gods because of the Old Gods being buried within Azeroth. Which, if we're being honest, always sounded like a non-explanation of things. However, it is far more interesting to know that much like the others who have given in to the old gods, the evil had to be willingly let in. And so Neltharion makes the trade, the power to save his legacy in exchange for the corruption of the old ones. And it worked. Neltharion easily takes down Razageth, sealing away the proto-dragon in the vaults of the incarnate on the Dragon Isles. However, Neltharion could feel the evil creeping in and made a last-ditch effort to keep the, his creation, the Drakthir, from the same corruption, freeing them from the hive mind magic that united his multicolored army while sealing them away. I actually love this change to the lore, that Deathwing had a noble purpose in his corruption and didn't just fall to it just because. It makes far more sense and is far more interesting especially considering what happens next. Because the experiments from Malagos and Neltharion didn't end there, at least I don't think so. Their works also included a special kind of Drakthir, one who could harness all five colors of the dragon flights in one grand warrior. And while this is a, just a guess on my part, I think that the elemental proto-drake Razageth is the source of this power, having been locked away in the vault of the Incarnates and used as the basis for the Evoker's power. Not only is Razageth connected to the Primal Plains, but the Drakthir starting area showcases the Black Flight Drakthir being upset that the vaults they were charged to personally protect had been broken, claiming that they needed to quote-unquote protect their legacy. Razagath is the source of the Invoker class's power, and it's entirely possible that the Proto-Dragon was also the start of research into the Dragon Soul, the artifact created by Neltharion that would harness the power of the Flights and that would eventually turn against his brethren. We'll know more about everything that I just said once the expansion hits and the Vault of the Incarnate's raid is out, which is going to be the first raid. 
And speaking of, an interesting name from the past is found inside the vault, and one that is also seen in the Drakthir starting zone. A clan called Grim Totem. Vanilla WoW had a much bigger focus on the smaller politics of its races and areas, because, after all, they had to fill those zones with something. For the Tauren, much of their questing in that period comes from their constant battles with the centaurs of Marudon and their constant feuding with the Grim Totem clan and their leader Magatha who sat on the Council of Elders at Thunderbluff, and, to make real-world comparisons, is an isolationist who would have really loved the Monroe Doctrine. The Grim Totem are a brutal group of Tauren. Unlike all the rest, instead of focusing on the teachings of the Earth Mother and the rites of passage found across the Tauren Plains, the Grim Totem are trained to kill from a young age. Violent and brutal, they believe that all other races are inferior and that the Grim Totem will be the ones to usher in the Tauren taking back their own legacy. A word that is getting bandied about quite a bit. And what is that legacy? The Tauren were one of the first races and one of the first to make contact with Elun, until the Titans came along and, in the Grim Totem's eyes, ruined everything. So it's no stretch to say that the Grim Totem clan also has a grudge against the Titans' machinations and would like to return to what they consider to be simpler times. I have to assume that's why we find Kurog Grim Totem front and center at the attack of the Vault of the Incarnates, freeing Razageth and attacking the islands with an army called the Primalists, followers of the great proto-dragons and the elemental lords, looking to return Azeroth to its primordial beginnings. And because all things are connected here on the show, this is where the Elementalists come back into play. Considered to be dark shamans, the Elementalists were the followers of the Twilight's Hammer in Cataclysm that followed Cho'Gall and the Old Gods, and attempted to destabilize the Elemental Plains after Deathwing returned for revenge and wrecked the entire planet. As seen by their portrayal in the pre-event uh, thing going on right now, thing, very technical word, the Elementalists have merged their mortal bodies with the elements themselves, becoming an amalgam of power. This has been seen before, not only in Kata, but with the Council of Shamans at the Terrace of Endless Spring in Pandaria, and at the Throne of Thunder with the Troll Elementalist Council who served alongside the Mogu as part of that off-splinter of Zandalaris who never left the Mogu Empire. And now we have Kurog Grim Totem, who may very well be the successor to Magatha, who appears as more elemental than Tauren and is looking to free the fearsome proto-dragon from its prison on the Dragon Isles. An interesting note on the Grim Totem, this isn't the first time it's been rumored that this clan of savages has worked against the natural order of the world. Multiple quests and item drops in Vanilla WoW seem to allude that the Grim Totems have co courted corruption once before, and possibly have even worked with the Scourge. This may have been how the Quillbore of Razorfin Crawl were introduced to the Scourge and became incorrupted, with the Grim Totem looking to destabilize their homelands and give the Tauren an enemy to fight while working behind the scenes. This also has connections to the Forsaken and Grim Totem working together early on, with Magatha attempting to bring down the Tarn from within and offering the Forsaken lands to spread their corruption, as well as a new set of people to experiment on for their eventual plague that would bring horror at Angrathar for alive and dead alike. However, the Forsaken are inevitably more interested in their own agenda and not in bringing down the Horde which leads the Grim Totem to work in some way with the Scourge. Side note, I find it of interest, as we know, that there isn't a current power holding the Scourge back that we know of. Bolvar Four Dragon still holds the mantle, 
but his power over the undead was shattered when the Helm of Domination was broken and reforged. So once again, who is holding back the Scourge Wave that, at one point, we were led to believe would wash over the planet if there wasn't a Lich King in place to control the Scourge? Questions for another day. And if you're wondering more about the Grim Totem, you're just going to have to hold on, because right now, Kurog's legacy and how he fits into things is still kind of up in the air, and we're not going to know anything until probably the Incarnate's uh, vault raid buildup, in which he is the final boss. Our last big connection is more housekeeping than guessing about the future, but it's hard to ignore how or what the Elemental Lords may have to do with the breaking out of a powerful proto-dragon and attempting to keep the dragon aspects from finding their lost power. If you haven't done it already, the new version of Oldemon, called Legacy of Tear, gives a little bit of lore, showing that the infinite dragonflight appears to be working with the Primalists, and their goal in the dungeon was to reach the Oldemon discs before the adventurers, which they do, with Chrono Lord Deimos throwing the discs of Tear back through time, and crowing that the secrets of the Aspects finding their power was now lost to time. The Infinite Dragonflight has long been a thorn in the side of the players, dating back to Burning Crusade, but their goals have never been fully clear. All we've really known is that the Infinite Flight was created when Nosdormu also became corrupted by the Old Gods, somewhere at the end of time, lost in the madness because he was the only one that was still alive, and was eventually defeated by adventurers with his last breath calling out to Amon Thul, the member of the pantheon from which the Bronze Flight gained its power. And yet, the Infinite Flight is not only still around, but now helping to serve those who serve the Elemental Lords, who in turn were former, dedicated followers of the Old Gods. They keep coming up. <laughs> After all, the Elemental Sundering that kicked off the Titans fighting the Elementals was all in an effort to free the Old Gods from their defeat during the Black Empire. That's a simple version of the events, but it stands to believe that the Elemental Lords see a chance to get back to Azeroth and may be moving pieces around. The Elemental Lords have always been in a weird position of never being able to die, but also never being fully explored in WoW's canon. While a big focus during the Kata expansion, including a new Firelands raid and the return of Ragnaros, there was also plenty that wasn't explored, including a cut raid that was supposed to take place in the ocean depths and involved the kidnapping of Waterlord Neptalon. You can even see the forgotten pieces of this raid in the Kata Dungeon, The Throne of Tides, with a defunct entrance meant to lead to a raid set in the Abyssal Mall, out in Vashir. I'm not saying that this is a direction the expansion is going, but I have to believe that the Elemental Lords will rear their heads once more, sooner or later. Regardless, Dragonflight is almost here, and there's a lot of potential in where the main World of Warcraft story is going. While it's a fresh start and the Alliance and Horde are working together in harmony, old stories from the past are coming back to haunt the dragon aspects and make life more difficult. However, that's where the guesswork will stop, as the only thing left to do now is wait, play, and enjoy the story. We'll come back around to where the Dragonflight story is after the first raid is out, and folks have gotten a chance to see the Vault of the Incarnates for themselves. Next time on Essence of Azeroth, we return to our Raid lore series with some related content. We're going to be taking a look not only at Molten Core and the origins of Ragnaros and the mistakes of the Dark Iron Dwarves, but we're also going to look at the Dungeon of Blackrock Depths, which is essentially a raid in itself. I mean, I don't think I have to tell anybody who ran it back in the day. That place took forever. This will also include information on the War of the Three Hammers and how the dwarves reunited. Dwarves galore. Until then, enjoy the expansion and continue to listen to the podcast. Lest the Tome of Clarity gains power and overtakes Kalimdor Public Radio for good. Can't trust that guy. Take care, friends. I'm <laughs> sorry.